I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Derek Wellsby. We've seen many of the different treatment options available today, but we also want to provide an update on promising research programs that might provide hope for a future free from glaucoma. Dr. Wellsby will highlight some of the most encouraging research in glaucoma. Dr. Wellsby received his medical degree and PhD in molecular biology from the University of California, Los Angeles. He then completed his ophthalmology residency and glaucoma fellowship at the Johns Hopkins University and Wilmer Eye Institute. He is currently assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego, Charlie Eye Institute. Dr. Wellsby is also a principal investigator of Glaucoma Research Foundation's Catalyst for a Cure Vision Restorative Initiative. That was awesome. Thank you so much for all your hard work, Dr. Wellsby. Please welcome Dr. Derek Wellsby. I am Derek Wellsby, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Catalyst for a Cure team, I'm here to give you a research update. It's, it's my privilege to be able to speak on behalf, not just of my lab, but on behalf of the rest of the Catalyst for the Cure team, which includes Xin Duan, Anna Latore, and Yang Hu. So Dr. Latore is at UC Davis. She is an expert in stem cell biology and in retinal development. Dr. Duan is at UC San Francisco, an expert in retinal physiology and regeneration of nerve fibers. And finally, Dr. Hu, who's at Stanford and an expert in neuroprotection, glaucoma models, and CRISPR gene editing. So let's begin with some background. The eye focuses light onto a tissue called the retina. If we use the analogy of a camera, the retina is like the film. And it's composed of many types of cells, one of which is the optic nerve cell. It has a long fiber that connects that point on the retina to a corresponding spot on the brain. Now, I'm showing you one cell. In reality, there are about a million lining the retina. And you can think of it as each one representing about a pixel of your vision. Visual information is processed by the retina and those optic nerve cells, and then transmitted via the optic nerve to the brain where we experience vision. So what happens in glaucoma? Here is an actual photo of a retina as your ophthalmologist would see when he or she examines your eye. We can't see individual optic nerve cells. So I've overlaid a cartoon showing 12 optic nerve cells and the visual field seen by a patient. Keep in mind that the optics of the eye invert the image on the retina. And that that little black spot is totally normal. That's called the blind spot. And it comes about because we can't see light that is focused directly on the optic nerve. In glaucoma, those optic nerve cells are damaged at their nerve fibers, right as they're about to leave the eye at the optic nerve head. Those fibers degenerate and the cells eventually die and portions of the retina become disconnected from the brain leading to vision loss. And this continues to spread and patients lose more and more vision and more and more optic nerve cells. And sadly for some, this can lead to total blindness. Now it would be one thing if this were a rare disease, but we have an aging population and this is a disease of aging. The graph shows how common glaucoma is in different age groups. About 5% or one in 20 of people over 75 have glaucoma, a huge number. Indeed, there are about 75 million cases of glaucoma worldwide right now, and we expect that number to grow to above 110 million in just 20 years. All of our treatments, including surgery, laser, and eye drops, they all center around lowering eye pressure. Yet, studies have been done 
looking at glaucoma patients in the community. And we find only about 50% of them have ever had an elevated eye pressure. And indeed, 50% will have a pressure less than 21 on every visit. Moreover, lowering eye pressure doesn't cut it for everyone. This graph shows what happens to glaucoma patients after diagnosis while being treated at a prestigious academic institution. Every downtick is a patient who went blind in at least one eye, despite pressure lowering. And what you can see is that by 10 years after diagnosis, one in six patients have gone blind in at least one eye. And admittedly, the study was not, uh, this was done a few years ago, so the numbers may be better slightly now. Moreover, one in 16 patients go totally blind. Now, on the one hand, that means that most patients don't go blind. And actually, I wouldn't even mention this otherwise, because I don't want to scare people. But these numbers are high enough that it underscores that we need to be able to do more. This is not an eye pressure disease. This is a nerve cell disease, just like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. It's just a different nerve cell. Instead of being a nerve cell involved in memory or, or movement, it's a nerve cell involved in transmitting vision. And because these are nerve cells, once they die, they don't come back. This vision loss is permanent. And all we have to offer these patients is the dog and the cane. We don't have therapies to restore vision. So the goal of the CFC we have two major goals. First, we want to protect our existing cells. For instance, this patient here with mild optic nerve damage and minimal visual field loss. For a patient like this, if I could just protect all of the retinal gain, the, all of the optic nerve cells that are there and prevent them from dying in the future, that would be a great success for this patient they probably don't even realize they have visual field loss. However, for a patient like the one shown now, where there is blindness and total loss of optic nerve cells, protecting what they have is insufficient. We need to be able to replace the lost cells. So let's talk about that first goal of protecting the existing cell. Now I showed you this diagram before. It's actually a little misleading. It shows all the optic nerve cells the same way. They have the same shape, same size, same color. In reality, there are many versions or what we call subtypes of optic nerve cells. They are connected differently in the retina. They're connected differently in the brain. And they're responsible for different aspects of your vision. Things like color, motion, contrast. Dr. Dewan has actually done some of the work in this field, understanding the various optic nerve subtypes. So it would really be more accurate to show a diagram like this. And it begs the question, do all these different subtypes respond the same way to glaucoma? Are there some cells that are more sensitive? Are there others that are more resistant? Can we learn from that? So first we needed to develop a good mouse glaucoma model to study this. There have been several developed, including by my former advisor, Harry Quigley, and by the head of the CFC Scientific Advisory Board, Dr. David Calkins. However, I'm gonna talk about one developed by Dr. Hu, my colleague here on the CFC team, which mimics a clinical situation. There are patients who need retina surgery, and occasionally, especially in very severe cases or repeat cases, those eyes need to be filled with silicon oil to prevent the retina from redetaching. And in a subset of those patients, some of them can have their eye pressures elevate and they can get glaucoma. So Dr. Hu's team had the very smart idea of using that to make a mouse model of glaucoma. They inject silicon oil into the mouse. And as with the other models mentioned, the eye pressure increases over time. If you look at the retinas, 
one or four weeks post-injury, you see glaucoma. In other words, you see loss of optic nerve cells, those little red dots in this picture of the retina. And that's quantified here on the right. As mentioned, Dr. Dwan has developed genetic tools to identify many of these optic nerve cell subtypes. Each mouse strain labels a different subtype. Different subtypes glow in that retina. And they can take advantage of this and watch the cells die in real time. For instance, this is a picture of a mouse before it's been subject to glaucoma. And here it is afterwards, the same mouse. And I'm gonna flip back and forth and you can see some of those cells dying off in the second picture. To help, I'll highlight some. There they are before and there they are after. So those are examples of cells that die in this glaucoma model. Victoria Shao, a student in Dr. Duan's lab, did a similar assessment and basically measured the number of dying and surviving cells in each of those mouse strains. And in each of those mouse strains, you're learning about a different subtype of optic nerve cell. And what she found is that some cells were very susceptible to that glaucoma injury. For instance, subtype number four here, if you raise the eye pressure, even by one week, you see a dramatic loss of those optic nerve cells. In contrast, other cells were very resistant. Instead of seeing 80% death, they saw 80% survival for this subtype. So of course, we should all be asking ourselves, what's different about the optic nerve cells that die compared to the ones that live? Well, Dr. Dewan identified a unique protein that was present in the resistant ones and not in the susceptible ones. Now, if that protein is the reason for their resistance, two predictions should come true. If we subtract the protein from the resistant cells, they should become more sensitive. Conversely, if we add the protein back to the sensitive cells, they should become resistant to that silicon oil glau uh, induced glaucoma. Kenichi Toma in Dr. Dewan's lab, working with my lab, did exactly that. We used CRISPRs or molecular scissors to remove the gene for this protein in those resistant cells. And then we repeated the glaucoma experiment. If the protein was present, the cells were still resistant. There wasn't much death after glaucoma shown here. However, if the protein was removed via the molecular scissors, now the cells died off in response to glaucoma. They became sensitive. Well, how about the flip experiment? Dr. Duan's team added the protein back using a gene therapy approach. You take the gene for the protein, put it inside a safe virus. We often call these gene therapy vectors, and then use that virus to infect optic nerve cells. Again, if you look at the sensitive optic nerve cells, after glaucoma, there's a lot of cell death. That's what it means to be sensitive. However, if they expressed this resistance gene, they died off much less in the glaucoma model. So in summary for this part of the talk, the team has identified a resistance factor that explains why some optic nerve cells subtypes are less susceptible to glaucoma while others are more susceptible. And we've developed a gene therapy vector to deliver this and decrease glaucoma damage. And right now we're trying to understand the mechanism by which this works. Next, I wanna talk about a different way to protect the existing cells. People have been trying for, for really for decades to keep nerve cells alive. We call that neuroprotection. And this has been true in neurology and ophthalmology. And there have been many, many attempts. And actually, this is just a partial list of those attempts. And these are the ones that are FDA approved. And even then, those don't really work that well. So you might be really discouraged, right? Like there's like, I think there's about 200 items on this list. Yet there's only, there's about 20,000 genes in the genome. So in reality, we've only searched about 1% of the genome 
in terms of figuring out what are good neuroprotective targets. Can we search the other 99%? So working with Don Zach's lab, we developed a high throughput screen to do just that. We used rodents and purified their optic nerve cells. We injured their nerve fibers. And just like in glaucoma, as I mentioned before, when an optic nerve cell has its nerve fiber injured, it dies. So we put these injured nerves into multi-well dishes using our robotics. And then we use a technique called RNA interference to turn down the function of, of a one gene at a time. In this case, gene one in this well, gene two in that well, gene three, all the way down the line to gene 20,000. We give it time and turning down most genes doesn't help. Most drugs wouldn't help because most genes aren't involved in the death. However, in some wells, we've turned down a gene that's involved in the death. And therefore the cells in that well won't die because they don't have that gene functioning. And then we can learn about the genes involved in the death of these cells. How do we find those wells with 20,000 wells? Well, we use automated microscopy, robotic microscopes that take pictures of all the wells and then image analysis software that counts the number of viable or healthy neurons. And then we can graph it and see which are the most interesting. So in this case, there's about 17,000 genes that were inhibited one by one. And we want the one that gives us the most survival, which was this dot right here, a pair of genes called DLK and LZK. So next we wanted to see if what we were finding on plastic was true in the animal. So we turn to the mouse optic nerve crush model of glaucoma. Here again, you damage the nerve fibers of the uh, optic nerve cells, in this case, mechanically, wait two weeks and they will die in response. This is what this looks like. So you're looking at a picture of a mouse retina. Each red dot is an optic nerve cell. Two weeks after that mechanical nerve fiber injury, you see profound cell death nearly about 90%. However, a single injection of an inhibitor of DLK nearly totally reverses that cell death in this model. So what is DLK? It's a signal of injury. So in response to injury to the nerve fiber, DLK accumulates, migrates back up to the cell body of the nerve cell, Think of that as like the headquarters where decisions are made and executes a cell death program. And if we block DLK, the injury happens, but the cell doesn't learn about the injury, doesn't die, and we hope lives long enough to recover from the injury. So in summary for this part of the talk, DLK inhibition is robustly protective to optic nerve cells and it can be inhibited with a drug that we are currently developing. So now let's talk about those patients where they've already lost optic nerve cells and we need to replace them. Ultimately, that's gonna involve transplantation of optic nerve cells. And those transplanted optic nerve cells are gonna to need to live long enough to reconnect to the retina and reconnect to the brain. And you might think, well, geez, why not just use a, a DLK inhibitor? Seems like that's pretty good at protecting optic nerve cells. Well, interestingly, Trent Watkins did an experiment where he showed that normal optic nerve cells, if you tweak them, you can get them to regenerate their nerve fibers in the optic nerve. However, if you inhibit DLK, you can do all the tweaking you want, you don't get much regeneration. And so why would that be? Well, it kind of makes sense. If DLK is the signal of injury, if you cut off the nerve fiber via the injury, if there's no DLK to signal to the cell body, there's no reason that the cell body would want to initiate a program of regeneration. So any type of replacement strategy is gonna need that neuroprotective, but where we can't be preventing regeneration, we need to be encouraging regeneration. 
So the team set out to identify a new set of targets that when inhibited would give us that survival effect and this time improve regeneration, not block it. Now in past, we had used mouse optic nerve cells, but ideally it would be great to study human optic nerve cells. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people lining up to give us their optic nerve cells. So we have to do it without blinding the person. And we do that with stem cells. Amit Patel, who was a, at the time a postdoc in my lab, worked with Dr. Carl Wallen, one of our faculty, who is an expert in stem cell technology. We isolate blood from glaucoma patients, turn the blood into stem cells. We then genetically modify the stem cells so that they turn into optic nerve cells. If they turn into optic nerve cells, they'll turn red. And we then give those stem cells the instructions to turn into mini retinas. The ball right there is not an eyeball. It's a stem cell derived retina grown in a dish. And it's starting to make optic nerve cells, which are the little red dots. We then purify the optic nerve cells, add them to those multi-well dishes, injure their nerve fiber. And this time we're gonna measure two things. We're gonna measure how many of them survive, which ones survive, and which ones regrow their nerve fiber. And instead of using that technique called RNA interference, this time we're gonna use drugs to interfere with gene function. So in well one, we might add drug one, over here we add drug two, et cetera. Going down the line, we add an entire library of drugs. Again, most of the cells die, most of the cells fail to regenerate their nerve fibers, and we use robotic microscopes to find those wells where something exciting has happened. And it turns out, that we don't usually just have one interesting well or one interesting drug, we have several. So then we can use machine learning to try to understand those patterns and the common reason why these multiple drugs are giving us cell survival and regeneration of the nerve fiber. One of the targets we identified were called the GCK4 kinases. Shown on top in purple is the optic nerve crush model that you saw before. Before the cells were red, now, they were now they're labeled in a purple uh, color. Again, two weeks after injury, you see lots of death. But if we have disrupted those GCK4 kinases, just like with inhibiting DLK, we get survival. However, now the picture on the bottom where we measure uh, optic nerve regeneration, it's actually the opposite. Instead of decreasing regeneration. Now, when we inhibit the GCK4 kinases and tweak those optic nerve cells to make them regrow their fibers, we actually get much more regeneration. So in summary for this part, GCK4 kinase inhibition can both give us survival and improve regeneration. And again, this can be inhibited with a drug. So finally, let's talk about actually replacing those lost cells. How is it gonna happen? Well, initially I think people believed it was gonna happen with embryonic stem cells. So embryos obviously have the ability to turn into any tissue in the body, any cell type in the body, but working with embryonic tissue presented problems. So the revolution came when we learned that we could use induced pluripotent stem cells. By putting in these four genes, into any cell in the body, you could de-age them and turn them back into stem cells. And then you could use those stem cells to turn into whatever tissue you want. Obviously the tissue we want are optic nerve cells. Dr. Latore is an expert on taking those stem cells and driving them to differentiate into optic nerve cells. And again, here instead of red, they're shown in green. However, an interesting thing happens with these optic nerve cells that are derived from stem cells. They go great initially, but then they die off. And so we asked the question, could we improve their survival by inhibiting those GCK4 kinases? And the answer was yes. It's shown in right, you see many more green dots surviving in those little mini retinas 
and those are the optic nerve cells. And the big question was, well, what happens to their fiber regeneration? And as predicted, instead of having this kind of runty regeneration shown here, they had very nice, robust regeneration of their nerve fibers when exposed to that inhibitor of the GCK4 kinases. So now that we're getting better, a better substrate for transplantation, the next question is to actually do transplantation. So Dr. Latore has set up a model where she can inject these stem cell derived optic nerve cells into a, a mouse eye and then look at their ability to survive, integrate into the retina and connect back to the brain all in real time. And of course the question will be, can our neuroprotective strategies, our resistance factors, GCK4 kinase inhibition, can they improve that transplantation process? And of course, we'll keep you updated. So in summary, we can generate these stem cell derived optic nerve cells and are currently testing ways to improve transplantation. In conclusion, we've talked about glaucoma resistance factors and understanding those genes that might control why some optic nerve cells die, whereas others live in glaucoma and leveraging that as a therapy, using unbiased high throughput screening to screen through the genome and identifying robust neuroprotective targets like DLK, finding other targets like GCK4 kinases, which give us some neuroprotection and enhance regeneration. And finally, the use of stem cells to turn them into optic nerve cells for transplantation and vision restoration. Of course, I want to thank the people who actually do the work there in my lab, especially Dr. Amit Patel, uh, also Cassidy Lee, Shirley Wu, and Mai Vu. The rest of the CFC team, including Dr. Dewan, Dr. Latore, and Dr. Hu. David Calkins, who's the head of our scientific advisory board, and Tom Bruner, the head of the Glaucoma Research Foundation, and all of their funding and support. Thank you very much. <laughs>